Thank you all and welcome to the first meeting of the task force. Um, I am, I'm Ladaris Cordell um, and I have been asked and accepted the appointment to chair this task force. Uh, I thank the task force members, I thank all of you for volunteering your time and your talent to serve on this task force. We are not an investigative body. Our role is to make recommendations to the university in the aftermath of the incidents detailed in Mr. Moy's report and in response to your experiences and the comments that we will receive from the public. If our recommendations are to be meaningful, we, this task force, we must be courageous, we must be honest, and we must be bold. We are all here because we care about this university and because we know that it can and should be a place where students, staff, and faculty of all backgrounds can thrive. And for this reason, we are conducting our work in an open and transparent process. I ask that of task members, task force members, that we be respectful to one another. I ask that when we disagree, we not be disagreeable. And I ask that we speak freely, and when we do speak, that we do so clearly and, as importantly, briefly. Finally, it is my intention to keep on schedule and to use our time as wisely and as productively as possible. To that end, we will start and we will end on time. And I will do my best to move things along. So let us get down to work. Uh, everyone has the agenda. It was also posted online. And so we'll begin with introductions. And basically, as we go around, if you will say who you are, and this is for the benefit of those watching, and also by what name you prefer to be addressed. Mm -hmm. All right? And we'll start at the, my far right. And make sure the microphone, that's one per two people, except for the front table here. And please, I'm asking the uh, tech people to make sure all the mics are on. And by the way, the mics, I understand, will stay on. So if you intend to have a private conversation or say something you don't want to be heard, do not sit at this table and say it, because it will be picked up in the microphones. All right, we'll start over to my far right. Uh, Tess, one, two. Coach uh, Wainwright, Administrator, Athletics. Gabby Gonzalez, I'm a fourth year senior here at San Jose State. Good evening, Rick Callender, second vice president of the California Hawaii State Conference of the NAACP. Maria Luisa Lanis, faculty member, interdisciplinary social science department. Uh, Michael Randall, academic advisor uh, for academic advising and retention services, and part time lecturer for the College of Science for a first year experience course, Science II. But is everybody hearing in the back? We're good? All right, go ahead. Uh, Linda Hyden, um, faculty in, in um, psychology and Senate chair of the Academic Senate of the San Jose State and preferred name Linda's. Make sure you use the mic, okay. Uh, my name is Diana Zen. Uh, I'm a fifth year nursing student. Okay, would you repeat it because your mic was off for a bit of it? Okay. My name is Diana Zen. Uh, I'm a fifth year nursing student. My name is Gary Daniels. I'm a fourth year political science major. Um, President of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Epsilon Mu Chapter, co-founder of the Black Unity Group. Ellen Lynn, Director of Counseling Services. Okay, I'm Judge Cordell. Uh, Peter Lee, third year student and Vice President of Associated Students. Willie Hagen, President of California State University, Dominguez Hills. Bernadette Shane, Professor Emerita of Theater, Humboldt State University, and former faculty trustee. Delorme McKeesteval with the Santa Clara County Office of Human Relations, Office Manager. Uh, Gabriel Rodriguez, Junior, uh, Sociology major, um, and I'm AS Director of Intercultural Affairs. And I'm Marcos Pizarro. Uh, I teach in Mexican American Studies. I'm a professor here. I've uh, been here for 14 years. I'm Chris Cox. I'm a lecturer of faculty in the Department of Sociology and Inter Interdisciplinary Social Sciences. Okay, is that it? And I, we're missing one person then, and that's Anthony Ross, the Vice President of Student Affairs. Is that right? Okay. All right, so thank you all. Uh, the next on, item on the agenda is to look at our meeting schedule. It was sent out to you. Does anybody have any problems with that? Okay, we have the dates. They've already been set out. All right. 
Moving on, if silence means you agree, no problems. Yeah, yeah. All right, the next is uh, public forums. It's my intention to hold a minimum of one, and perhaps more than that, of uh, forums where we don't say a word, and we listen to members of the public, that is students, staff, faculty, and members of the community at large. So, um, and I think the best way to determine when we should do that and how many is to see what we accomplished at our meeting today. One thought I have, and by the way, I'm gonna ask you to, to jump in and give me your thoughts on this. One idea I have is that depending upon how much we talk about today, it might be very good to have the next meeting to be a public forum where we've put out how we feel or what we've seen and maybe get input back. So maybe what we'll do toward the end of the meeting, take up this issue of the public forum, whether or not it should be scheduled the next meeting or maybe we should wait out a little bit. Is that all right with everyone? We'll just kind of wait till the end and see how we feel. All right. Yes. I do prefer to move to work by consensus if we can, instead of voting on everything. All right. We'll see how that goes. Um, uh, no one has a problem with public forums. Is that okay? Meaning input from the public where we listen and learn. Great. All right. Uh, executive session. Uh, I've listed this because um, I've thought that it might be that we might want to have one session where it is close to the public where we're just working on the draft. It's a working meeting on language. It doesn't have to be, but that's kind of up to you all, and that's something we don't have to take up until we get closer to the end when it's time to put all of this together. So I'm putting it out there now for you to think about as we're moving along, and we may even hear in the public forum some people who may have feelings about that one way or the other. But it would be a, a working meeting, nothing new taking in, taking in, but kind of figuring out where we want to go. All right? And uh, deadline for the report, uh, I have imposed the deadline of, of April 30th. That means done, written out. Uh, so that just gives you an idea what we have to do. I believe we can do that and have these sessions and get the information out. Okay, so uh, let's go. We have actually more than an hour and 30 minutes to talk about the specifics. And today I want us, this, this meeting, to talk about what happened. We know now the facts from Mr. Moy's report. And in Appendix 4, there is a chart that he put together a timeline of what happened. These are facts now. So again, we're not the fact finders. That's been done. So I, I'd like us to talk about that and talk about what happened in the context of San Jose State's policies, procedures, dealing with student conduct, dealing with uh, training, uh, RAs, student trainings, uh, the frosh orientation, uh, review of uh, student affairs and housing, all of that stuff. And I'm going to kick it off because I am probably of this group the least familiar with how things work here at San Jose State. And I, as I went through all of the documentation, some things came up that I would love to have some feedback on. So I'm going to throw it out, and then this is certainly not to stop you all from doing that, uh, but I thought I would just put some things out there without getting your answers yet, and then we can kind of go from there. So first is this. I noticed in appendix, excuse me, Exhibit B. In Exhibit B, there's a list, uh, there are agreements that the students in this particular suite signed. And it, and I'm going to pull one of these out. With me a second here. And these are agreements signed by everyone in the suite, like suite mate A, victim, suspect four, and all that. And I noticed, uh, and remember the date is really critical. So these events came to light in October, that is to the parents. They apparently had been going on starting back in August, according to this timeline. So I looked at one of these agreements, uh, and so I'd love to be enlightened about why students sign these things, but it looks, so I can give you an idea, it's in the handwriting of the students in the suite. And I noticed on one date, it's September 23, 2013. It is signed by suite mate A, victim, suspect four, suite mate B, victim roommate, suspect three, suspect two, and suspect one. And the last entry is handwritten by one of these people, and it says, other issues. So there are three listed. One says, open windows before using toaster, turn on fan, two. Second one says, ask permission before eating each other's food. And the third says, no bike lock of shame. 
and that's in quotes. Now, that was written in September, September 23rd. Right. So I am curious, and maybe we can talk about this now, to whom did this document go? Who got to see it? And I'd like, I'm just curious as to why no bike lock of shame. We now know to what that refers, right? To the bike lock that was uh, put around the victim's neck. So why, I, I'm curious, what is this document? Is, can anybody on this, and if not, you know, when we do further kind of research on this, maybe we can find out. Does anybody have any information about these documents that are signed on the, on the residence, here on the task force? Nobody? I do. Okay, so, Gary? Yeah, so Actually, I- if you identify yourself just for the- My name is Gary Daniels. Go ahead, Gary. I lived in a CVC as a freshman. That's the same um, dorm that the victim lived in and the perpetrators. So when you move into housing, you have to sign a roommate agreement, um, essentially, which is supposed to get all the roommates on the same page so that they can live together, you know, cooperatively and not get into any agreements. So, you know, that's why you write, uh, open the windows before you use a toaster, things like that. And it's supposed to be checked out by the RA. And I'm assuming that the RA did not do his or her job properly in this okay. situation. So Gary, so if you're a freshman, this is, is this for just freshmen or anybody each year when they come into the dorm? How, do, how does that work? It is each year. I'm sorry, you have to identify yourself. Uh, sorry, Linda Hyden. Um, it is each year. I think, I believe they spend, and Gary, you can probably clarify this. I think they're there for a couple of weeks so that they have an idea of the issues that may arise. And, it, and then they meet either with the RA or meet together, come up with these agreements. So they have a basis, as Gary said, to be all on the same page. So, there was, so there was likely a, and that's a true meeting for in the dorm. with the students, all these people who signed it. Correct. And you're saying an RA, or is it more than just the RA, Gary? Is it generally, how does that work? That document goes to the floor RA. The floor RA. Can you tell me what a floor RA is versus whatever, is it just someone who's in charge of the entire floor? Yeah, so the RA is, uh, in a sense, the first line of contact for our students living in the dorms. Um, students go to the RA for any help they need, housing um, issues. So what, where are these documents stored? So this agreement, because this is a copy, right? Does this get distributed to all the students and then a copy stays with the RA? Does anybody know how that works? No, all right, so these, yeah, Gabrielle? Yes, so um, initially, the, after the couple of weeks of the students getting to know each other, the RA then goes back to each room and sits down with um, the students to see if they come to a mutual, mutual agreement. Then that contract, um, after being signed by everyone, goes back and they take it, um, I believe they file it in the case that anything does arise, they look back to the contract. Um, uh, to see, you know, if anything on there has been breached. So the, the original of this document gets filed somewhere? Is that what you're saying? And yes, from my understanding. I, I lived with an RA in CVB, um, and that's just the procedures that I would see her do after going to each room and uh, gathering the documents. They have to file it down um, in, in housing. Yeah, the reason I think this is critical is I look at the timeline from ex Appendix 4, it says bike lock one and two, and that means there were two different occasions where this student had the bike lock put around his neck or at least an attempt. And both of them say early, one says early September and the other says mid-September. And then we have this agreement signed September 23rd, which would be after these two incidents, saying no bike lock of shame. So, so this is, again, we're just kind of raising issues now. So I have, the question is, if that was written and was taken in and supposed to have been read by an RA, why wasn't there some question raised? Because clearly the student, the victim, had complained for it to be down here to say no more doing this, right? So, um, so what I'm gonna do is just, I'm just noting this down as I'm trying to see, this looks like something fell through the cracks here. Right, Gary, you had mentioned about, your feeling was like the RA had maybe not followed up. What, what's your sense about that? Well, I think a lot of things fell through the cracks in this situation and in regards to African-American students on campus. Right, but I'm talking about specifics. Remember, we, we, we can't make recommendations unless they're based on some facts. So we have a fact here. We know there's a fact that the bike locks were used, and we know for a fact that somebody wrote down about it, and we know for a fact that nothing happened. 
until the, the parents came. So I'm, I'm saying what we should do likely is just make a note of this, and if we need to figure out why that, why that happened and what recommendations we might want to make aside from that. Um, I'm going to just keep talking oh, here about a couple thing. of Yeah, just go right ahead. Just to be clear. Just to be clear. So the RAs are students, correct? They're not professional staff, nor are they trained like professional staff, correct? So yes, that might be students. something to note as well, who the RAs are, so that as we make recommendations, the expectations on these individuals is appropriate. Okay, I think that's a good point. Do we, you wanna look at the RA training? Cause that's in the appendices. Go ahead, uh, you all go ahead and make comments. I'll find this section. Rick, Rick Callender, so I, I agree the RAs are students, but I think there's some very specific guidelines that define the nature of what the RA's responsibilities are. So one of the things that I wanted to look at is what the, uh, if the RAs are an agent of the university, I think that it's clear to me from what is defined uh, that they have a supervisorial role that they are more than just students, but they're actually agents of the university. So I think that's within the appendix. So um, Chair Cordell, I'm not sure when you want to address that or how you want to move sure. towards that. We but can that's talk definitely about it an now. issue I wanted to address. Sure, we can talk about that now. And, and I didn't, there was, um, sorry, I'll, I'll get to know names in a little bit. Uh, Coach Wright. Yeah, did, Coach, did you have I, Yes, I, you want I to just want to know what was the chain of command uh, from the RA to, to what was the next step? Or like you said, do they just take them, file them in a drawer in their room or wherever they have them, or does it go to somebody else, or does it just stop there? Okay. So we've got an issue about this, just, just RA training, um, and I guess the kind of like the chain of command, so who's responsible for whom. Um, other comments on that? I, I found some of this in the appendix, appendices, and I'm glad to point to that, but go ahead. Say who you are. Yeah, Ellen from Counseling Services. My understanding is that RA reports to ARLC, which is Assistant Res Life Coordinator, who reports to Res Life Coordinator, who reports to Associate or Assistant Director of Res Life. So there's several layers of command. So I'm just wondering, in this instance, uh, the RA clearly didn't make much of it, didn't, didn't notice it. So um, is there anyone who reviews these agreements above the RA? And if not, we maybe think that that might be a recommendation to make, that we need to get more scrutiny of these contracts when they're signed. So because that would have been a red flag right there. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, do you want to continue more talking about the RA training? Rick? Well, and what I'm uh, specifically referring to, I think it's an exhibit to, I'm trying to make sure I get the title right, but it's the, one of the attachments exhibits where it kind of defines. What, do you what mean the, the appendix or the exhibit? Because there's two so big the, documents. Ex, the exhibit. So I believe we received three. Uh, exhibit H, maybe? And that has to do with senior resident advisor, resident advisor theme, and all that, right? Correct. I'm trying I think to that's get. exhibit H, if you all have it. Okay. That's under exhibit H, that's correct. Okay. And so underneath that, it describes the different roles, and uh, unfortunately, I don't know the names, but Ms. Lynn, she had described uh, the, I guess, the reporting structure of the RAs to the <coughs> RLCs, um, et cetera. And so, so what I had um, identified, and, and it's on um, page, I believe, 56 of the attachment. So it's like two of five, uh, page 56, where it's talking about, and I think it's the RLC, so maybe I'm getting that confused with the, what the RA is, but their, but their role is very clearly divined, defined as supervisorial. They have very little, um, they have the ability to make decisions and uh, require very little, uh, very little checking off in terms of management decisions. So I think that, and I, I don't know how this was reported up, but I, maybe I need to explore and understand a little bit better the RA versus what she uh, referred to then as I think the RLC and then refers to a, and then right. um, reports up to another one. So maybe for okay. my understanding, maybe I should Rick, better. Let me, let me do this wait. to cut a little bit. Exhibit H, the first document in Exhibit H, I just wanna read you the first sentence. Under the direction of the Residential Life Coordinator, RLC, and or the Assistant Residential Life Coordinator, ARLC, the resident advisor, RA, themed community resident advisor, TCRA, and senior resident advisor, SRA, are responsible for working closely with other university housing services, UHS, staff members to develop and maintain an atmosphere 
that promotes residential communities through excellence in academics and personal development opportunities for students. They are charged with developing communities and presenting programs that involve students, faculty, and staff. So that's kind of the intro to this, and it lays out basically the rest of their responsibilities. So that's the start of it. Are there any members here on the task force of members of the San Jose State community that can talk any more about this whole RA and CRA, so all of that stuff? Anybody? Well, uh, I think we need to clarify because from my understanding, uh, they lived in a themed community for engineering students. Right. Um, so that would be the uh, TCRA. But I would imagine they go through, um, since they're listed on the same um, uh, qualifications as RA, they would go through the same training. But I think um, just to look into that for the purposes of this um, case, because I think it would be a TCRA. Okay. Anything anybody else wants to just add on this for now? Um, I have a comment. Yeah, go right ahead. Say your name. Uh, Willie Hagen, president of Cal State Dominguez Hills. Having put my way through undergraduate school as, as an RA, uh, for a good chunk of time, I, I understand and appreciate uh, the pressures of a student um, having a sort of supervisory role related to their peers. Uh, and I do want to look at the issue of training because one of the things that struck me is that although there weren't a lot of um, things that sent signals, it seemed that that room had a number of visits. Um, there was a the visit about the flag, there was a visit about the closet, there was a visit, a follow-up visit about the flag. And I think that even though there aren't any tangible things coming out of that, what I found is that multiple visits to a room usually meant you should probably look a little deeper. And so I'm just suggesting that as we look at the issue of RA training, I respect the work that RAs do. But if we're trying to help them, training is a, you know, our requirement. And the stuff I looked at says there's a very good training program here. But that just might be another aspect of training to look at, is that what signs might you look for? Because most of the report talks about there weren't signs of actual uh, discrimination or harassment. But I think sometimes just multiple visits alone are signs of something that require further uh, evidence. Other comments on this? Because I, I think that's absolutely critical. There clearly is a problem. There was a problem, at least in this situation. There were red flags, I think, all over the place. Mm -hmm. The multiple visits, the agreement, um, and the, nothing seemed to get picked up. So, I mean, I absolutely believe we really, really need to take a look. And this is without blame or pointing fingers, but we need to take a look and look at whether or not we need, we, I do believe we need recommendations regarding training. So what we're going to need in order to make recommendations, we have to understand better what that training is. So it might be important perhaps to invite somebody to one of these meetings to say, okay, talk to us. What's the training? Show us the documents that are used. How much time? I have no idea how much time it takes to train the RAs, but maybe more time is needed. What level of students are they? What kind of background do they have? Who knows? So these are things I think we need to ask. Um, Michael, did you? Well, uh, you just made the point that I want to make, which is it's not just about training. It's also about the level of student, the maturity level of the student. Because I'll tell you as a person that works in an office that employs students, sometimes we expect students to function as professionals and have the wisdom of years that simply sometimes they don't have. So what might be apparent to you or I at my, at my age, where it's at a, at a person who's a senior's age, if they have sophomores up there and they go through three weeks of training, I don't know if they would pick up on those subtleties. So we might need to look at what is the minimum qualifications for how old a person has to be or what class level they need to be at to get that position. Uh, I don't know about these. I, don't, I didn't see anywhere where they identify them as sophomores uh, or, or juniors. Uh, I know at San Jose State, students tend to identify more so in years as opposed to class level. So we might need to look at years. But the point is, you know, there's a big difference between having an RA who's, let's say, and not to disparage all 18-year-olds, but an 18-year-old versus, let's say, a 22-year-old, uh, just because of life experiences and understanding the subtleties around certain things such that when you say red flag, that, that, that presumes an ability to interpret a subtlety. Okay, so, and another issue that comes up, thank you for that, is, is what about how diverse are the 
RAs? I mean, do we have, are there people of color, are there folks that are gay? Um, you know, so I, I don't know. Uh, and I think that could be a factor as well. Gary, do you have any notion? I mean, you just your observations, or any of the students here who have observations, or, or is, is it a diverse group? Well, uh, I just wanted to say, I think in regards to RA training, I think there should be some type of examination between the distinction of whether the problem lied in the overall training of RAs or the RA training when it comes to African American students. We don't know if the RAs aren't being trained properly, period, or if they aren't tr being trained properly on African American issues. I think that needs to be looked at. Okay, good one. I just want to make a really quick comment on um, the di uh, Peter Lee. Um, I just want to make a quick comment on just how diverse the RAs are. I mean, we certainly have a huge diversity of RAs here on campus. We have um, RAs that are sophomores, juniors, seniors, super seniors, um, students of all backgrounds, majors, ethnicities. So I wouldn't necessarily look at potentially that the diversity of the RAs um, as an issue in this. I don't know if I agree with that, but it's all right. It's your view. Okay. Yes. Um, I think the diversity is important, but also diversity training. I think we, we have a very diverse student population. And I think what is more important is how are RAs trained to work with this diverse population? Um, and can they look at um, what to me would not be nuanced, but might be seen as nuanced, but the s symbolic importance, for example, if you see a Confederate flag, that should raise a red flag, and uh, that room should be uh, monitored very closely. You know, I'm going to talk about the flag thing just for a second, and I'll sure. call on you. I was looking through, again, looking through the exhibits, and I came to Exhibit I. And Exhibit I has something in it called training for behind closed doors. It's some sort of a program, and I, again, I need somebody to explain it to me. And there's another one called Through Open Doors. And it looks like it's training for, I think, RAs or people in that, okay. So I, I go through it, and I come to behind closed doors, and what do I find? They, these, whoever gets this training gets these hypotheticals that they have to kind of work through. And what is one of them? It's a flag hypothetical. And it's really interesting. This one says, while on rounds, you hear what sounds like an argument down the hall. So you go to see what's happening. You just got this, and then it says, this is the, the person who is the, one of the students. You, you just got this awesome flag representing your family's religious heritage. You've put it up in the common area of your suite because it's a bit too big for your room. And you and your roommate agreed not to put big stuff up because your room is so small. So then another student says, you notice the new flag up in the room. You are impacted by this. You are offended by what you believe it represents. You don't believe in any one particular faith and feel the flag doesn't respect you. As such, you don't think it should be in the common room. You asked your sweet mate to take it down, but they refused. Now, that's right here in the training part, okay? And it's interesting, I looked at all these hypos, there are other ones, none of them deal with race. None of them. So I'm looking at, wait a minute, clo behind closed doors, what happens in the, and then I looked at the next one, through open doors, there's nothing about race. So it's sort of it's like it's the elephant in the room, and the training doesn't really address none of the hypos that I saw. And maybe I overlooked them, but I took my time kind of reading through these, I saw not one. Uh, Linda Hyden. Uh, I am not certain that what we have documented are the only hypotheticals they use in the training, uh, and I think that would be worth trying to find out. I do know that the independent investigator did kind of send someone anonymously to observe and had a very positive response to the training, but I honestly don't know the nature of the time period in which that person was there, mm -hmm. but it's certainly worth our finding out. Sure, absolutely. Also, Ellen Lynn, um, it also looks like what was presented from the investigator is the most recent training. I don't know of the RAs, what their previous trainings have been from the beginning. I, I appreciate that. Um, but this incident happened in August, and, and the incidents went forward from there. I'm, again, I'm not sure where this came from, if this was something. But the fact is, I, I just can't imagine. 
I, I just, I'm just talking about me now. I can't imagine having trainings like this on such a diverse campus and not having one scenario dealing with race. I, 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 I don't know, I, I just find that troubling. Yeah, right ahead. Um, so my name is Gabriel, um, and I'm just wondering, like, we're discussing, uh, we're discussing this a lot, and all CSUs have RAs, and most universities have RAs, so there's no, like, across-the-board regulation of, like, what kind of trainings people should have. So I'm just seeing this as a, is this going to be, like, a landmark case where, like, RA trainings is going to change throughout the CSUs, or, like, we're just, we keep talking about this, and I'm just wondering, like, is this going to be a landmark case of RA training? Because there's a lot of universities that have these trainings. Gabrielle, I, I think it's important that whatever we do, I think it's going to be looked at by all the CSUs and wherever else. And I think that, yeah, we could absolutely, an outcome of this may be that they look at theirs to see if indeed changes need to be made. And I think that's important and that would be go beyond even this university. I think that's a good thing. Others? Chris. Sorry. Hi, Chris Cox. Uh, a couple of things. One is that I did, uh, I'm glad that uh, Maria Alanis made the point that having diverse numbers of people on campus does not translate into being trained to work in diverse populations. That's something we need to keep in mind. The other issue with training is, I think it's one thing to have an initial period of training, but it's another thing to have follow-up. And so what I'm wondering is, and what I think maybe we need to investigate, is the extent to which there are follow-up forms of training for students. Uh, you know, for example, police officers train continuously. And there are some jobs for which we need to have people training continuously. And this is true of faculty oftentimes. And so I, I think that if we're, we're operating on the mindset that says we need to have a good training, we're missing something something because we need to have continuous training. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, is that I also saw a few things, and, and this, the documents that we have to work with are quite lengthy, so I think it's going to take us a little bit of time to kind of fluidly flow through them. But I saw in some of the other uh, reports from RAs a couple of things that made me wonder, and this is just something to say, uh, some things that we can investigate and look into. It made me wonder about the perception on the part of the RAs about who would actually read the documents. So in other words, going back to the issue of the hierarchy, who is it that's in a supervisory position that will take the time to scrutinize the documents that are submitted? Or is there a perception that this is just something that's perfunctory, we write it down, we stick it in a, in a file and nobody ever looks at it again? Um, and so I'm thinking that th that's, a, that's something where we need to have a little bit more query at this point is what is the process by which documents are reviewed and analyzed? Excellent, okay. Um, I know that there is an organizational chart included in the materials and for the life of me, I'm trying to pull it out because I thought I marked it, for housing, for all the, for how it works. And it's I know it's the end in of the, appendix. the end of the appendix. Yeah, the appendix okay. is I'll, the, I'll keep, the last appendix. Thanks, I'll keep appendix. looking here and I'll pull it out. Because that that's also something we need to uh, focus on. I, I want to, yeah, go ahead, Delorme. Um, I also wanted to just switch. Make sure you, is, there, is your mic I'm on? I'm Delorme McKees is, is, is it on? on? Tap it, just tap it. Sometimes I just need to be close. All right, you're good. Okay. Um, you know, after reading all these documents, and now that we're focused on the fact that there were alerts, there were alarms, um, and the way the media has been covering this story, and um, I, I'm just concerned that now we know that early on, someone was trying to tell someone that there was a problem, when right now what we have in the media is that no one tried to tell anyone. And, I, you know, and I'm worried about the victim. And there might be other victims that were in that room as well that tried to make an effort to send this alert, and yet our report tells us that there was no effort on the part of the, the victim or anybody else in the room. And I think that's important for us to correct now that we know it. Okay. So I wanted to you build say your on, name? I'm Marcos. Um, I wanted to build on Chris's comment um, that I think that we're talking a lot about RAs, but we also we really need to focus on professional staff and the professional staff that are supporting those RAs um, and because they have the job of helping them see the things that they're supposed to be doing. I'm having clarity on that. But the other thing that I know from, from working with some of the people who are, who are at those ARLC um, positions is that they have an inordinate amount of work that they're doing um, and they're managing a whole lot and, and, and being asked to do just an extreme amount of work that they oftentimes feel they can't handle in the number of hours that they're paid for. Um, so it's just 
a little bit more for us to think about. I don't want us to focus exclusively on RAs. I think we need to look a little bit higher up. And as we look through these documents carefully, we see we need to really focus on higher up and what are they doing about this because it's easy to kind of pass the buck. I, I, I absolutely it. agree. And, and we need to be familiar with what is the system now because I, I think there was a failure in the system, right? So I think we need to focus. We need to focus on this system, who, who reports to whom and see where the, the openings or loopholes were. And uh, so that's why I think maybe at the next meeting, we need to bring in somebody who's intimately familiar yeah. with all of this working so that we can ask questions and get familiar with this so we can, again, our whole purpose not to point fingers, not to blame, but to make recommendations for a better system. So, and, and then one related comment is that I felt like the nature of this report, and it's because of the mission that was given to the fact finder, um, but the nature of this report was to find out if San Jose State was at fault, right? And so the whole thing is framed as, what, 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 did they miss out on any of the responsibilities that they have? And the finding is, no, they didn't. But I think that whole approach is wrongheaded, right? I think we need to be looking at, how did this happen? And then how did it continue to happen? And how did it continue to happen without anybody taking note and doing something about it? Marcos, that's exactly why we're doing this. Yeah. That's exactly why we're doing it, OK? Yeah. And so I just wanted to say it because of the nature of the report is so much about San Jose State not being at fault. I, I appreciate that. And the report found that there were certain policies that were not violated. That begs the question. Because if there were rules that were not violated and this happened, there's a problem, right? That's why we're here, exactly. Let me go over here. Rick? Uh, yes, R Rick Keller, I'm happy that you, um, you're touching on the policies. And I, I think the, the contents of the report are, are, are rather interesting, at least that's the way I'll describe them. W one of the policies that I noticed is distinguishedly absent, and maybe I just overlooked it when I read through this uh, two times, but basically the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and there's no policies that were mentioned or, weighed, or, or the activities were weighed against it as it relates to sexual or racial harassment. What I saw was a clear and ongoing incident of racial harassment that the university, the university said all of these policies weren't violated. However, that seems to be noticeably absent, and I want to make sure that at some point we go deeper into the discussion um, of how the activities rated, uh, re uh, related towards uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Okay, and I draw your attention then to the executive orders that are contained in these documents here, because they do reference Title IX. I saw that in there. Um, and um, I did not, and I've reviewed this as well, see anything mentioning about the Civil Rights Act. But again, this, these executive orders are kind of come from on high, uh, so we need to, to look at those and see what else ought to be included in it. Over here, did I miss somebody? We have a new person in. If you want to just state. Good evening, and I apologize for being late. Tony Ross, Vice President for Student Affairs, California State University, Los Angeles, and flight delay. It's all right. Thank you so, so much I'm, for I'm being here. I'm trying to just get the context before I start to weigh in. Great. Thank you so much. Over here. There's, there's also the period before the student uh, even arrived on campus and the placement um, in a particular environment where he was the only minority person in the room, which is of concern to me. Um, I've seen it happen on other campuses, and I've seen the risk that it posed for students that were placed in that environment. So I'm curious about what mechanisms, what methodology is used to place students, especially on such a diverse campus, so that they will feel comfortable and can recognize themselves in the room. Okay. Because from what I understand, the, it, in the document, it, right, it said that these, these placements are completely random. That they, there used to be a system in place that they used, and they found that it wasn't, work, it wasn't really working effectively to match people up well. And so they removed it, and now it's completely random, which seems to me, to be honest, ridiculous. Okay. So this may be something, again, uh, we were talking a little about RAs, but this is, gets to just the assignment of students. Um, my understanding, random. I'm getting a sense, at least from, from Marcos, that that shouldn't be the case, that more thought should be going into it instead of it being random. How about over here? Go ahead, Linda. Uh, Linda Hyden. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I believe that was the initial thought or, or the, the information that came out is that this was the only student of color in the suite. But in fact, in the report, that, uh, it, that was corrected. So there, <clears throat> there was a student, I believe, Latino, uh, and also age of Asian background, I believe. So there, 
which obviously that's still three out of eight. I, I do certainly recognize that, but I just did want to, uh, because I uh, had the same information you did until I just noticed that today. Uh, and in terms of the random assignment, um, I think it would be very good to hear from someone from housing on the complexity of that, because I don't think that's quite as easy as it sounds. The, the random assignment, the students are then, they do have the opportunity, I'd be very concerned about that if they had no opportunity built in to make a change. But in fact, they have a, within, I think it's two weeks or a month, or I, I'm not remembering the time frame, but they do have the option with no questions asked to make a change in their housing assignment. Uh, and then even after that period with, with reason, they also can make a change in their housing assignment. So I think that is an important piece to include in the full right. context. Those, those room changes are in there, but I always think, you know, what about the student who is shy, who just right. like, oh, you know, I really need to do this, but I, I'm just not going to because it's not in the personality to do it. So, and, and there's, but so much the university can do. I mean, people come with whatever they come with, right? right. But there are some things. I think we should look at this issue of room, assign, of room assignment. Um, we should have somebody come in who's informed about it, who can talk to us about it, and we, we may think it's fine after we hear from it, or we may make some recommendations to change that. Over here, and again, state your name. Bernadette Shane. Uh, we are aware from the report that uh, the victim very specifically requested a roommate uh, and that he had a previous relationship with him. So that That's does- That's high school. Yes. Right, so that, that does suggest it's not completely random. It isn't completely random. Okay, all right. Um, so I, I've just noted down, we, we need to get someone in here to talk about the training of not just the RAs, but those who supervise the RAs and on up to give us a sense about it, and someone perhaps to, to come in and talk to us about the assignment of students to the various rooms, suites, or whatever. Okay, um, yes. I have a quick comment. Your name? Yes, uh, my name is Diana. Um, so according to the room, yeah, they do, we can pick our own roommates, but I think everyone else that was in the suite was random because you can pick your own roommate, you can't pick your own suite mates. That's how, I think Got that's it. how it goes. Okay. Um, and also, I think now that we're all talking about just the RAs and RA training, um, we can talk about student orientation. All right, because, we'll, get there, we'll get there in oh, one second. Okay. I just wanna make sure we covered enough now on RA stuff, all right, and room placement. Then we'll move to it, I promise. So um, back on the topic of RAs, um, I'm looking again at this roommate agreement that they had signed at the beginning of the year, and we kind of talked about things falling through the cracks and things not being noticed and signs um, being missed. Um, and I noticed on the roommate agreement that there's nowhere that the resident advisor signs off, so I'm not exactly sure. How does that conversation happen? Maybe we need somebody from housing to come in and explain how does that conversation happen? Do they just turn it into the RA? Or does the RA actually have to sign off on it to show that the RA, in right. fact, understands what their agreement was? Absolutely. And, and so what, what concerns me is that there was a red flag. No bike lock shame. What, that, what is that? So if someone had maybe had picked up on that, so that you're exactly, I mean, that's on point. So we'll, we'll get somebody in. I think we will do that. Uh, Michael. I'll go, I believe Gary had his hand up. Gary, go right ahead. And then I'll that's right. I'll see you, Gary. Um, um, uh, very quickly, I'd like to touch on um, institutional failure. I think uh, Marcos made a very good point that the report uh, essentially says that the university did nothing wrong. Well, a few minutes ago, you did make the uh, point that when, you, uh, that when you checked out the RA training, there was nothing to do with race in there. Um, well, I'll just say that considering the retention and graduation rates and overall enrollment rates of African-American students are so low, I don't think that we should be surprised that SJSU's policies, you know, don't have anything specifically dealing with African American students since, you know, African American students are essentially failing at this university. Okay. Michael? Uh, the only thing I would also like to look at with respect to housing is, uh, as was mentioned in the report, this was a theme floor. This and was so a theme floor? This was a theme floor mm -hmm. uh, from engineering. So my question is, did we just throw a bunch of engineers on the floor and do no programming with them. Usually when you have a theme floor, if you look at other institutions, there's an expectation that there's some programming that happens around the, the theme. Uh, so I didn't notice that, and I do understand that there's study groups and there's some academic stuff that happens. Uh, but I, I have a question as to whether or not the programming for those students was anything special beyond Good. just being in the dorm. Okay. 
Um, so I just had a quick comment um, just on that, and this is just from my knowledge as someone who knows uh, resident advisors that are in theme communities. Um, from my understanding, each RA gets a certain stipend um, for, their, for their monthly programs, and I believe, and this is from my understanding, um, resident advisors in theme communities get a slightly larger stipend to be able to fund those um, special programs for those majors. Because with respect to, and I'm kind of piggyback on uh, some of Gary's ideas, with respect to the low enrollment of uh, certain ethnic groups on campus, certain majors have even a smaller enrollment. So if you're looking at a program like engineering, if you're looking at a program like the, something in the sciences, then that becomes even much more important because there's gonna be even fewer of those students represented in those particular majors. <clears throat> Uh, so that's why I'm very concerned about the diversity training. And also with respect to diversity training, I want to make sure that that doesn't get interpreted as stereotype training. Because uh, there's a difference between diversity training and stereotype training. Uh, so I think those are some of the things uh, worth investigating. Okay. Good. Over here. State your name. Hi, Willie Hagan. Um, and this will probably come up later on, but I just want to add it here. We're talking a lot about the RAs, and I think that's important. But I also was cognizant of the fact that the RAs weren't the only people in that room. There were students, there were friends, there were lots of other people. Yeah. And um, you remember the commercial years ago that said, friends don't let friends drive drunk. And the research shows that people are more willing to say to a friend, give me your key. And so I was struck by, even though someone is telling you not to report it, and they know it's bad, that they didn't speak up. So if a part of me feels there's a marketing issue that is part of our training of the general campus, that you don't let these things happen because clearly other folks in the room were aware of this and felt their concerns but didn't speak up. And I think there are times you do speak up even if your friend tells you not to. Because again, if you go back to the drinking campaign, that was one of the, one of the problems. If friends said, I can drive, you let them drive. But, but marketing turned that around. So I think again, I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but at some point I'd like to talk about the kinds of things that, a recommendation that talks about the kind of training that should be available or public relations to the entire student body about how you take responsibility and not be afraid of that. Okay, I promise you we will get to that. Um, that's on my list of things to talk about. And I'm gonna go to Gabrielle. Ellen. Okay, Ellen. Had, I'll go after him, actually. <laughs> Okay, um, so what, let me get straight. So it'll be Gary, and then Ellen, and then Gabrielle, and then Chris. Okay, go ahead. Um, just to shed a little bit more light on uh, Michael Reynolds' comment, um, I think that there needs to be uh, some type of examination in regards to the theme floors and how they affect students of colors and how we can improve those theme floors for students of color. Okay. I know that we're talking a lot about the race and ethnicity issue because that's what's happening on what we found. But I just want to also, and not to water that down, but to also for us to consider other diversity issues as well. I think the charge of this, this committee, this task force, is to come up with a recommendation for inclusive campus, and that includes a lot of variety of diversity. I think that's very important, and we are going to make sure we do that, um, because there were references, just very quickly, if you look in the Fact Finders report on page 24, uh, there was a note that the suspects, I don't know which ones, left a uh, for when he they took his shoes, mm -hmm. and one of the references says, uh, "Most must powder das boot unless the German shall shoot, for that is the faggot's fate." In the enrichment center, you must wait, and that was the that room that they had taken the door handle off, uh, and goes on. So, I mean, there there are issues here about, um, you know. Oh, gay, lesbian. There, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that we and um, and the references. You know, the swastika, the whole. You know, the presence of Jewish students on the campus. We 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 have a lot we're going to talk about. So I just want you to know it isn't just about uh, issues dealing with African Americans. Although we're going to spend a lot of time on that. Okay, uh, who was up? Okay, Gabriel and then Chris. All right, um, maybe I am really, really jumping the gun, but um, we're looking a lot at policies and we're, we're not really getting a chance to talk about the culture of the campus and the programs and services that are being offered, especially like the marketing. Um, and we're not looking at the psychology of the student or how long, so we're not doing that, but we really are like looking at how long, because how long really our training is gonna be? Is it gonna turn into a year training? And there's one RA, for a whole floor, so how are we gonna expect them to read 
all of the all of the papers when they're also a student. And um, I was looking at the structure right now of the hierarchy, and it's just very complicated. And there's Joe West, there's a BRICS, there's three BRICS, there's Joe West, there's CVC, there's CVB, there's CVA. So how are the RAs gonna really like take charge? Maybe we're gonna have to hire way more people. So I'm just very confused. Gabrielle, you, you, but, but you're right on target. What, what, we're, Gabrielle, yeah, what we're saying is that we need to look at what exists. And if it's so complicated, and maybe we, our recommendation is, there shouldn't be just one student for a floor. Maybe, but we can't get there until we know what, it, what is. And then, from folks here and from members of the public, we're gonna get some ideas about how to remedy this if indeed it's problematic. So that's what we're doing now. We're just saying, what is it? What exists? And if it's problematic, what are we gonna do? What recommendations will we make? So I ask your patience. We are gonna get through this. But the first step is to identify what exists. Chris. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say a couple of things that really line up with the, the last comments, starting with the gentleman here. Um, and what we're really starting to get at is the larger issues of campus climate. And I think those are the things that go beyond issues simply of policy. And so I certainly uh, take to heart your statement about being patient about that, but I just wanted to make sure that we bring that up now, that part of our task here is that we actually have to look at the overall campus climate. That means campus climate for students who live in the dorms. It means campus climate for students who don't. It means campus climate for faculty and for staff as well to see what are the things that we could be doing that could actually make a, a more inclusive campus and what are the things that maybe have been going on that we've been kind of glazing over just because no incident has happened up until this past fall, right? And so those are the things that I think we need to kind of be able to look at that are a little bit less tangible. So uh, I'm hoping that we can, you know, there, there has been over time, uh, you know, campus climate report and things like that have come out, but hopefully we can uh, have a little bit more opportunity to kind of delve into some deeper issues as we go forward so that the recommendations that come out of this body can address Thank those you. things. Thank you. I envision spending a considerable amount of time on environment. So the first part of this task force meetings are dealing with the specific incidents. That's why we get at well, what happened here, why were these things picked up. The second part will be dealing with campus climate. To that end, I have just downloaded the final student report of the Campus Climate Focus Group Research Project for tw fall 2011, prepared by Dr. Susan B. Murray of the Department of Sociology. Um, I ask that all of us um, read this. It's 108 pages. Uh, it gets right to the heart of what Chris was just talking about. Uh, maybe you've all read it. I've just read it. Um, and um, I envision asking, I don't know if Dr. Murray is still here on the campus, I envision inviting her here and giving her a good 20 minutes to come before this task force and talk about this. Uh, I, I, I'm just, I'm just uh, what can I say? I, I just learned quite a bit, and I'm, I'm truly an outsider, and this is uh, beautifully written, uh, gets to the heart of things. So I envision having a meeting where I want, would like to have, if she will come, Dr. Murray here to just to talk about this, and that gets us, kicks us into talking about the environment. So that's part of what I have envisioned, okay? So if, uh, by the way, I do have the website. If you wanna download this, anybody can, and I, I, if you want, do you want me to just read you the website? You can download this report? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna read it off to you. HTTP colon slash slash www.sjsu.edu. Now here we get to the other stuff, ready? Slash president slash docs, D-O-C-S, slash uppercase F as in Frank, uppercase G as in green, uppercase R, report, uppercase S, student. So it's F-G, report, student. And then there's a space and it says logo with a capital O, final with a capital F, dot PDF. <coughs> All right. So that's the report that's gonna be critical to our talking about um, environmental issues, all right? Can you send us that link? I'll be glad to, and I'll ask uh, Dorothy who's assisting me to get that link out, Thank okay? You. Great. And I do wanna note, speaking of environmental issues, I, I can't help but notice that I'm the only staff person at the table. And staff primarily are the ones who have to implement policy mm -hmm. when it comes to this kind of stuff, you know? Staff are the ones who kind of have to be there at night in the dorms, it's not the faculty. Uh, staff are the ones, and, and so I noticed when we put these kind of things together, it's almost like the institution has a blind spot when it comes to staff. They see students, they see faculty. 
And fortunately, you know, our, our good colleagues on the faculty side at least mention us in the sentence when they go faculty, staff, and students. But I noticed even here, they're real quick to put my lecturers slash next to the staff part. Uh, so again, that's noticeable. And a number of staff people did come up to me and, and talk to me about that. Okay. So I told them I'd definitely mention it because it is noticeable. And we want these staff people who have these concerns to come speak to us when we have our, our public forums. Thank you. All right, um, we were gonna talk about frosh orientation. In just one second, I wanna pick up on something that, first name, Willie. that Willie mentioned. And he said, you know, there were other students, right, that were, I, I use the word, maybe it's a little too strong for some, I say complicit. That, I mean, if you know there's something going on and you don't do anything about it, you're part of the problem. And actually there was more than just that. So I refer to the timetable, uh, the very first one. Race-based nickname created, Student A. And if you read the report, it's about a student who had this idea that they're gonna call this person three-fifths. And then it, it morphed into fraction. And this student knew what three-fifths meant because that student explained it to the fact finder. So we get this whole issue now about students who, one, were actively involved and didn't apparently have a problem with it and others who were told by the victim, this is what's happening to me, but I don't want you to say anything. So let me give an analogy. In the workplace or on a campus, if you work on a campus and you know that there is sexual harassment going on and somebody says, don't say anything, you, because you know, the whole university is on notice. You have to speak up. If you don't, then you create liability for the university, right? So now we have students who were told, I'm not talking about the nickname student here, who were told by the victim, this is what's happening to me and don't say anything, and they didn't talk. So I, I thought about that, then I looked at what we got sent as part of the report, Exhibit D. There's this sheet here, and I don't know, and I, maybe Gary or if the other students here can help me tell me where this, to whom this goes. And it's this sheet from Exhibit D, and it says, see something, say something. Someone who witnesses potentially harmful behavior and takes action that has the potential to lead to a positive outcome. That's what it calls the empowered bystander. And, there's, and then it has a website, uh, sjsu.edu slash Spartans for safety. I don't know where this went or who, who gets it, but this is, I mean, the, the, the goal of this is if you see something going wrong, you're supposed to speak up. So does anybody know what, where this is, who gets it? Um, Linda? Uh, I can address that to some degree, Linda Hyden. Um, it is uh, uh, put up in the dorms. It's part of freshman orientation, at least it used to be. I, I can't speak to the, the most recent. Um, and there is, has, have been attempts for that to be uh, disseminated and encouraged across campus. I uh, do think that, you know, particularly after this incident, a, a lot of people were discussing, you know, we haven't done enough in that regard. So I, I do think there's clearly an awareness of that, but um, it has been disseminated in a number of different ways to students. But, you know, the question is, has it been enough? Deloney? Thank you. So with a Can you bring it a little closer to you, too? Mm -hmm. Again. So with a theme like that, again, I, I have to ask the question, uh, what thought is put into educating these very young people about what are they seeing and what should they be saying? Because, you know, they're young. A lot of them have had very little life experience with other cultures. Mm -hmm. And so I don't see on this campus that there's an understanding that diversity is not just numbers, it is also really activity that makes everyone aware that this is a diverse campus. And therefore, you have to develop certain skills and knowledge in order to engage on this campus. I also noticed if you want to complain, have a concern, you see something. I went on the website, and I, I didn't see anything. But I did find something. I found I went to the president's page. And it says, if you have concerns about crime or something going on with then so who, what student goes to the president's page 
You, you don't. I mean, I, I did because I was just, you know, on a search. So, I, again, you know, a concern about how do we, how does this institution alert people uh, to how do you bring up a concern? And then there's this whole issue you've just talked about, about students who see something on or an ask, please don't say anything. What's your responsibility? What's your obligation when you know that this stuff is going on? Because clearly, these students, to a person, said nothing. Okay? Uh, and that doesn't make them bad people. It just says, you know, what, what's the thinking? What, what, what does this university want students to do who know about this stuff? And that's something we need to talk about as well. I mean, so what do you all think? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, so as uh, w when I was, when I brought up freshman orientation, um, I was thinking those terms. Um, we have videos about, um, about, you know, rape or like in that, teaching about how, when to say no and you have to respect no, and also about safety. But what about, what about racial discrimination? What about that? We don't have anything that shows students visually what they can do and what problems that exist. And um, I was a recent delegate of leadership today that was in January, and that was all three days of that retreat was diversity training. And it was so powerful, it was so great. And we all said at the end, we, this should extend to all of campus. What their message for us was, as leaders, we should go and spread that to everyone else that, that we know. But why can these people get first-hand experience of that diversity training? Because it was that amazing. So tell us again, what, what was the training? Who was it for? Um, so Leadership Today it happens every year. It's helped um, by student involvement and Mosaic. Well, those are two people that I know that were involved. And um, they, they have applications for anyone on campus, and you apply. And we had 45 participants this year. And they have these sessions of three full days of um, retreat where... So, so let's go back just a yes. second. This is called Leadership Today. Today. And mm -hmm. when you say they send out applications, who's... Student Involvement and Mosaic. I guess Mosaic, they're the coordinators. Right, Mosaic. That's a multicultural... Our multicultural cross -cultural. center. Okay, Mosaic mm -hmm. and... Student mm -hmm. Involvement, that's um, all the... That student Involvement is in charge of all the clubs and... Um, <laughs> external activities on campus. Okay, so this leadership today, does this happen at the beginning of the school year? Or what, what yes, it happens in January. Okay. Year, winter break. So go ahead. So um, they incorporate all these activities of teaching about diversity of all types of racial disabilities, um, everything, and anything that you can come across. And it just opens all our eyes to these 45 students uh, to what leadership is, to know what yourself is before you can help others, but also just learning about, it definitely talks about racial, a lot of racial things, and your own, and how to respect others, and this is just really, really great experience, and I think it should be extended to campus. It's, and, and, and so the 45 students, are they undergraduates? I mean, they're all? Um, yes, they are undergraduates. I had a lot of RAs, and we actually talked about this incident, um, but it, Enhance their own experience and also. Mm -hmm. And how many students explain. of color were among the, this, this particular group, the 45? Actually, I, from my observation, everyone was a person of color. If that helps. So there were no white students in there? There were. Everyone, let's just say so the majority was a minority, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay. And um, it's, we don't, I don't think they pick by race. It's more, if you send this application about, how you're a leader on campus. So they choose based on your, your leadership on campus and, um, and what you can have contributed to the campus as okay. a leader. Okay, that's not particularly a part of freshman orientation. No, right so what my point so is, let's, go ahead. is bringing all that what leadership today has and maybe bringing the coordinators of that and bringing what programs they have and incorporating some of that into um, freshman orientation. Okay, so let's talk, oh, go ahead, Peter. We'll move to frosh uh, orientation. Yeah, so I was actually um, a freshman orientation leader this past summer, and um, I can comment a little bit about the way we do our uh, diversity training for the freshmen in orientation. Um, so the main contact point that we have with freshmen in terms of training them is the skits. Um, so orientation, freshman orientation, is a two-day process. The first day is all day long. They stay overnight, and the next day they have advising sessions where they sign up for classes. At the end of the first day, uh, we show skits. And these skits educate students on a wide array of things, how to deal with college depression, how to deal with roommates. Uh, there's a very big part in there about the roommate agreement. And there's also a part about um, four students that are each very different. Um, and we highlight um, what it's like being a student who feels uh, different than other students. And we highlight 
how to interact with students that are very different than yourself. So we do highlight diversity. However, there isn't anything, um, to my recollection, about necessarily race or culture. Um, so maybe that is something that we can potentially add to that skit, is how to deal with um, the racial side of, of the diversity, because the way the skit is now, we mostly talk about, I believe, um, sexual orientation is one of them, um, socioeconomic background, as well as uh, the hometown being um, a factor of diversity. But like I said, in that training, there isn't necessarily anything about racial diversity. Do you, do you think it should be included? I think that'd be a fantastic idea, given, um, given that um, this other student um, is mentioning how important it was to have that um, diversity training at Leadership Today. I think that would be an excellent thing to add to the skits or to that freshman orientation experience. And, and these skits are performed for? For all the freshmen in attendance for orientation. I, Coach. I, I'd like to say that can be department uh, issues. I know in athletics we do diversity training that we have somebody come from the NCAA and meet with us every couple years and some of our students are involved in that. In the fall and the spring we have evenings of awareness where we talk about issues that are happening on campus for the athletes. So I think that can be a department um, uh, problem or issue uh, in, in the sense of they you know, um, should work on you know, training as a department because as you know the university is made up of many departments and there is training going on and we have it and unfortunately it doesn't trickle down to everybody else. Okay. And is there is this training that you all do, is there a you know, is there a document or something that can be shared with other departments? I mean how I I, I'm sure there is. I mean, we have a representative that uh, that comes from the NCAA, and it's trained by the NCAA that speak to all issues, uh, race, um, uh, pretty much everything. And uh, we do that every few years, but our evening of awareness is um, we just, uh, our uh, student life coordinator find the hot issues that are happening around campus, and we present it to all athletes in the fall and in the spring. Have you all talked about this incident? Uh, not yet. Uh, we, we had one planned uh, uh, a few weeks ago, right at the beginning of the semester. Uh, it was basically about uh, plagiarism, academic integrity. But I'm sure this will probably be on, on the list. Okay. Other? Yeah, go ahead. It's um, striking to me how the terminology that was used, um, three-fifths and the Confederate flag, how embedded it is in history, culture. Um, and I think there's also an opportunity to talk about how we teach history at this university and um, teaching the mainstream history, which for the most part it excludes race, <coughs> class, gender, um, is not going to be sufficient for our student population. And I think a lot of the students back off when they hear racial terminology. They're just not used to talking about it. And it's, it's frightening to them, it scares them. And I think that there's an opportunity here, although I know that freshman orientation and staff, but also as faculty, we need to um, make sure that our classes are inclusive and possibly we have an opportunity here to make sure that students take an ethnic studies course or make sure that history is taught from an inclusive perspective. Okay. Um, I just want to add that, yes, I, I agree with what's been said so far in terms of the training for and recommending, you know, LT leadership today for the rest of the student campus, but I also want to recommend that that kind of training needs to happen with faculty and staff and administrators because we all don't know how to talk about these variety of issues. We all don't know how to talk about what whiteness means and what transgender means. That kind of conversations need to happen at various levels. Okay. All right. I just wanted to touch on the campus climate. Yes. I think good points were raised in regards to uh, freshman orientation, uh, in regards to educating and training our actual students, and in regards to ethnic studies. I think that when you're talking about educating these students, uh, we are in Silicon Valley after all, so it would be a great disservice if we were producing a bunch of future engineers, business leaders who were not properly trained in dealing with uh, ethnic minorities. So once again, I think that ethnic studies, looking at ethnic studies, you know, ethnic studies requirements, especially African American studies, should definitely be um, considered as a possible requirement 
for our students. We have currently have areas R, S, and V, which deal with civilization, culture, race, society, et cetera, and it's an option, one of many, to take an African American studies. Actually, there are no African American studies courses for area S and V. There are Mexican American studies courses and Asian studies courses, but there are no African American studies courses. So, you know, I think that we need to look at having more upper division African American studies courses that students, you know, take to be educated on, you know, African American issues, background history, and also any ethnic studies. Um, lastly, I think this discussion is very important in regards to ethnic studies and education because this previous semester, San Jose State intended to cut its African American studies department. It was supposed to be cut in spring 2014. So, you know, I, I, you know, I think there's a clear lack of, you know, commitment and dedication to providing these types of resources to educating, you know, uh, our, our, our diverse student population as well as uh, resources to increase, increase the success of African American students. Okay. Marcos? So I think there's two different issues that we're talking about here. One is how do we, pro how do we uh, help students understand these issues? Like, so how do we prevent these kinds of issues from happening? But then the second is if they do happen, how do we address those things when they do happen? Um, and the second is the one that I'm particularly interested given all the mishaps that happened with this incident. I, I think one of the things that I point to um, that stands out to me vividly is, is in the report it was stated that um, Res staff said, if we had known there was an African American student in the suite, we would have acted differently than we did, right? Which is problematic to me on two levels. On the, the first level is that, well, you should have looked into it. You should have looked into it and who, who's in the suite and how were they affected, what is their race, and what's the impact of this incident on them? But the second piece is, to understand that the types of behaviors that these students were engaging in were um, reflective and indicative of intimidation, of harassment that could be waged against people of other religious backgrounds, of other sexual orientations. Um, and, and so I get real concerned, like when they move these students out, where did they move them to and to who were they put? And was it just because they weren't black that they weren't in danger? Right, like that, those are all the issues that says to me, related to Maria's comment earlier, is that we don't understand <laughs> what this is, right? That flag is used as a, as a symbol of intimidation. It's used to threaten people. And staff, nobody said, hey, wait a second, we need to look at everything that's going on now. We need to stop, right? And so that gets to, this, to, the, to the second issue that I said, which is how do we understand these issues as a campus? Who's training us to look at these issues complexly and, and to really get down to work, right? And so that's what I hope we're gonna also take on. Okay, great. Yeah. Anybody on this side? Okay. Good. Uh, as I said earlier, you know, I, I I I think we need to look at all of the people involved, not just the the RAs. I, I believe in holding adults accountable, and I, and I and I and I don't use that word to be disrespectful to the students, but as I said, I also hire students, and there's peer advisors and peer mentors, and we have specific rules about what we allow them to do and what we don't allow them to do because I can't have the expectation that my student staff perform at the same level that I'm expected to, to, sure. to perform at. Uh, I've, I've been trained a certain way, I have a certain level of education, I have a certain amount of age on me. So I, I can't expect that of my students. And it's real easy to sit here in hindsight after having read the report and, 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 and look at a lot of subtleties that we are catching and, and, and look back at them and go, well, why didn't this, this sophomore catch all these subtleties? I, I don't think that's necessarily reasonable. Uh, where were their supervisors? Exactly. Were these reports reviewed? You know, so, those, so to me, that's where we need to lean. The other piece of this, though, is as a person that works with freshmen, and I, and I tend to be more teleassertive, uh, I am concerned that when we bring people to the campus, we don't sit down, and maybe we do, and if, and if we do, somebody please correct me. We don't set down strong expectations for how we expect you to behave. And that goes beyond this particular harassment. There's, what, what Markles is saying, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is there seems to be a pattern of behavior here which is unacceptable. Right. And somehow it was acceptable, and it blew up. And this young man was the victim of it. But we have student code of conduct. We have in policy 
that hazing and harassment and what have you is not acceptable. And we also have policies which state, if you are privy to this, you have an obligation to report. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna pick on Gary's memory because he's younger than mine and his memory might be better. But we had a meeting between the faculty, the staff, and the president, and we asked a number of questions with the black students involved. And one of the main questions that came out is there was a young lady who pulled up the policy on her telephone and said, we're told that if we are privy to something or we participate in something, we're liable. And her question to housing essentially was, is this true or not? And the answer we got, and Gary kind of helped me out with this one, was a non-answer. It was kind of like, well, sort of, kind of. So we got policies that are out there that when asked, do we enforce these, you get answers like, sort of, kind of, depending on what day of the week it is. So it's, it's not like some of these things don't exist, but we have selective enforcement depending on who the person is and how much trouble we think we're gonna get in and how much our behinds we think we're gonna have to cover if we enforce it, et cetera, et cetera. All this plays onto whether or not we're gonna enforce it. So the message to the students are, are maybe you can get away with it, maybe you can't. So at some point, we have to be willing to enforce our own policies because if we're not, even after we recommend, and even if the university accepts, we'll still be back here behind some non-enforcement or something that's already been written down. So, you know, it's gonna take some courage on the part of the institution to be willing to stick by its own guns. Thank you. You, you know, I, I, I wanna address the one thing, I hope we don't go down the path of looking at and approaching that because of the youth of the RAs that they didn't and shouldn't have known better. It's the responsibility of the university to ensure, this goes back to the training, that when you have people acting in positions of responsibility and positions of supervision, and you're acting as an agent of the university, that you are properly trained. We're not talking about an obscure symbol here. We're talking about a well-known, widely publicized symbol of hatred that was held by the Klan. This is not something that when it was hung up in the window, the RAs didn't recognize that, wait, hold on a second, it's a problem. They said, wait, hold on a second, we know there's a problem and we're not gonna do a reasonable thing of trying to figure out who lives in that room. There was so, also a swastika too. That's now. correct. So, so I'm saying that these are these are not these are not symbols. And people said, "Oh, look at that! What, what is that symbol? I've never seen that before." The RAs did the responsible thing, but they are also in a responsible position of having to do a reasonable investigation. They should be trained to do a reasonable investigation to say, "We saw this in your room," and say, they said that they didn't understand who was in there. Why are we not accounting for culturally who's in a room when you see? That symbol of hate. That was not a reasonable investigation that was done. These are his reported it up and reported up to, uh, to through levels of supervision. So we cannot get into a situation of saying because of the youth and inexperience that they don't recognize it. Well, they should be properly trained. And if the training is the issue, then let's call the issue and let's, let's not look at the youth and ex inexperience. Let's look at the issue itself. And I believe it could be training. Okay, so let's look at where we are right now. I just want to kind of mm -hmm. take a breath here. So where we are is that we believe, and, and let me know if I'm, I'm accurate on this, that we should have someone here who really understands this whole, and I, when I say RA, I don't mean just the RAs. I mean the entire, to whom the RAs report, who does, who trains the RA, and then up the chain, right? That we might want to hear from someone here who has that information. I don't know who that person is. Gary? Um, I would just like to say that I sincerely hope that we aren't solely focusing on housing in regards no, to this I'm, task I'm not, force. I'm not, I'm not right. there. So, there's yeah, no. just I'd like to make clear that there's an entire campus climate that the university has not, has not addressed. And I'm going to get there. I'm getting there, Gary. I yeah. promise. I'm getting there. Oh, so, uh, one more thing. So I think uh, in regards to the last two comments okay. made, uh, I think that we, uh, based off the support, I think we can safely say that there is no zero tolerance policy where there should be, or if there is one, it's not zero tolerance. Okay. All right, so, so one area is we need information. How does this system work? What's the training? How does all that happen? Straight up the chain. So, because we know we've identified this is a problem area, all right, at least with respect to this incident. Uh, does anyone here right now know of someone who is that person? 
who can come in and say, okay, here's how everything works, and, and know the information. I believe there are several people who could be available to do that, and I think uh, that could be, I think they have to determine availability and things, but I think there are actually right. several people. So I'll check that. with Chief of Staff to find out. We want to get someone in who has the information. Peter? Yeah, so um, I have noticed in the audience there are um, a couple RAs. Would that maybe be of the benefit to the discussion to have them answer a couple questions? Or no, we no wait public on that? input. Okay. We're, we're sticking by the rules here. We'll get all that. Okay. We'll, get it, we'll get it at some point, I promise. Um, Coach? Coach Wright, I think Rick brings up a very good point. It's what, what are the priorities of the RAs? If they spent more time dealing with race instead of alcohol, because it seems like if you just have a bottle in your room, you're busted and you're brought up on charges and everything else. So I, I think we should really look at what are the, what are the priorities? Are, are, are we just looking for alcohol? What are we looking for? What are they trained to, to, okay. to, to notice? All right, so, so I need your input on this. If we have someone here who is knowledgeable, who knows the system, works in the system, do you want this? I think this should be used as an opportunity to ask that person some questions. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's how we're gonna get informed. Yeah, I just have a related question or concern. Um, it seems to me like the, from the first point of knowledge of these events until the time that the students were suspended was like five weeks or something like that, which seems an inordinately, an inordinately long time to me. Um, and so I would, as part of this Q&A, or maybe it's a separate Q&A, I'd like to understand one. how those processes work. It's probably a separate one. Cause it, I, yeah, because yeah. it, it did seem to me like SJSU's actions were in response to the district attorneys. And I wonder if the district attorney had not been involved, would we have made those actions? Okay, I got that down. That's another uh, issue we want to talk about. Yes. Can I address that? <coughs> uh, actually, in the, I think we're all having a hard time uh, digesting the report and the amount of time we've had to do that. Uh, but there are details in the report that I found uh, quite helpful to me um, about that timeline. It was not, San Jose State did not respond in, uh, because of the DA. In fact, they're the ones who forwarded the report to the DA's office. So it was quite th the other way around. Okay, let, let's, uh, let's do this. We're, we're not gonna, I mean, if it's in the report, you read it, you can right. have your own interpretation of however you feel. I just wanna get through to what we wanna talk about in terms of you know, keeping this thing moving. So I don't want to cut you off, Linda. So if you had something else you want to say, no, go I right ahead. No, I think my concern is is that it, sometimes it feels like we could get very stuck in exactly what happened when, in a way that keeps us from moving forward. To let's identify where the gaps were quickly and move toward the resolutions because I think the res the uh, the way to move forward is going to be complicated. And okay. so I, I that's right. I think that's where we're, we're not going to get stuck. I promise. I also just want to make sure that we're, I know we're identifying the RAs a lot as well and administrators. I want, I wonder also what happened to these perpetrators? Who is talking to them about what they did? And where's the education that's part of this process for them? I don't know from the report what I read. I, there's nothing identify about where they're referred to and what's the follow up. I don't want it to be just a punishment where they walk away not learning anything. We, we can't go there because there are privacy issues. They are having, uh, facing criminal charges. We can't talk about, we can't know their names. But secondly, we cannot even deal with that. They are in the criminal process. They're, they they're can't talk. forward. Well, we can't, well, we have to wait. The criminal process has to do its thing. So I, I, I just don't think, this is just my view, I don't think we should be spending our time dealing with the four suspects we have more global kind of issues about this. I appreciate what no, you're no, saying. What I, mean, I, mean, I absolutely appreciate it. If but it happens with other, hopefully not, but where are we with that? Other stuff, right here. Oh. Just give a name. Uh, Bernadette, uh, another thing that I think would be very important here we, is to take a look at the issue of the victim and victims. I'm sure that this individual is not the only one that has occurred over the years. And uh, young people coming into a foreign environment, wanting to fit in, wanting to succeed, and they encounter these difficulties. How do we help them to know that it's okay right away to stand up and say, hey, this is not all right. Something is happening to me that is wrong. And it seems in this case that it, for this individual, it was very, 
difficult to do that. So how do we help? Not just him, but anyone else uh, who finds themselves in a similar situation. Okay, we, we will discuss it. Delorme? Uh, Delorme McKeistable. My experience in this area also tells me that this is not just about training and who we train. It's about comfort. And I think in the, the climate study, that's one of the things that really comes out very clearly, that there's a lack of comfort um, to talk about these subjects. You might have knowledge, but you don't know how to engage in a conversation about this. And I think it's something that needs to be addressed. For me, it's like the elephant in the room. All right. So I'm, I'm hearing a lot about campus, hold on a second here, campus climate, and I think we need to move this up, and we need to bring in the professor who authored this report and have her talk to us and give us some information. I mean, we've read it, but I think she can amplify on it, and might she might even have some suggestions about how we can go forward in this. So I, there are two things that are pressing. I want to get dealt with this whole RA system. Uh, we need the information. I think we all agreed on that agreed with that. So we might want to have the next meeting. We have somebody here, um, and we, I don't know, I'm trying to think of how much time we want to take, have the person basically tell us what the structure is, hierarchy, then we can ask questions. We, we have specifics about where some things didn't work, and maybe find out and get suggestions from the people who work in the system. This is staff now, right, uh, about what we can do. So that's one big issue that I'd like to put on the table and get talked about early on, so that would be our next meeting. Then I, I would like to start, to, because all of this kind of, the other stuff has to do with climate. Uh, there are some specific things, like you talked about the process of, you know, how quickly does a university move when they see that something bad has happened to take action with students. That's a little different from climate, but it is something distinct, I have that here. Um, then there's this whole issue of just reviewing policies. Um, Title Seven, Title, you know, the executive orders. What are these policies, and are they enough? Are they covering everything? Um, I, I've certainly, as I said, I've looked at the fresh, the frosh orientation. I don't see anything about race in there. I looked. I see about. I don't see bullying that much, but there, there's some some things. So that's kind of like overall, and maybe we need to break it out. Frosh orientation, bringing leadership today, right, to that group. So um, a lot to cover, but how about for the next meeting, and we still have time here, we still have, we're good at 730, uh, RA information, and what about if the professor's available, we bring her in to talk to us about campus climate and this report, which would mean you're going to have to get this report, I, I ask you to, you don't have to, to get this report read. It's very readable and it's fascinating. Um, Comments? Sure, right ahead. Um, These are just my suggestion about what we would do next. I'm, I'm wondering if it might be, uh, another approach might be to hold the RA discussion till later. Now, we, I think we've had a good discussion on it, and I'm thinking that if we got into the issues of climate, culture, things on those lines, it would inform the RA recommendations better because of a broader context. And I'm just wondering if we might be getting into recommendations uh, on a very specific and sort of subset of the issue I, I like too that. soon. I like that. What do you all think, Mike? Uh, well, Gary had a comment Gary, first. Gary, and then and who's Gary. next? And then Michael. Yeah. Oh, well, I definitely think that we should get to campus climate as soon as possible. It's something the students have been raising uh, the concern about for a very long time. But I wanted to just briefly uh, take it back real quick to uh, housing uh, priorities, and it has to do with um, policies. But uh, like Marco said, um, for example, if a student gets caught with alcohol and marijuana, you know he's very liable to be kicked out of housing. Um, I see um, students getting arrested and carted out of um, Joe West and CBC all the time. Um, you know, in, uh, in first floor housing, uh, you know, sometimes strange people come into the dorms and, and they basically put up wanted posters, you know, saying beware of this person, oftentimes African Americans, Latino men. Um, but when it comes to, wait, you know. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on, I'm trying to understand something here. You talk a little fast. I'm so you said wanted posters are put up in the dorms? Yes. yes okay, be, slow down for beware, me, just tell me. Tell beware me. of strange person lurking. Okay, so who who puts up the, the wanted poster? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming RAs, but. Is, is this serious? I mean, is it meant to be serious? Yes. 
So what is, what is, you need to use the microphone. Sorry, SJSU has this report system oh, okay. when criminal activities happen. I see. Oh. Um, and recently, this semester in particular, I've seen several of these where they had a photo image um, and, they, and the ones that I saw were, I think, two or three African-American males and one Latino male. Um, and then they, they send those to everybody, so we get them, like, at our fax machine and ask you to post them. So what, what is the, okay, so tell me what's, these are people that are suspected of criminal activity? Yes. And so what is, Gary, what's, what is your issue on that? Right, tell me, tell me so if, you're if you're a student in, dorm, uh, in the dorms, you get caught with alcohol and marijuana, you're liable to be kicked out. Um, if you're living in the dorms, you know, you get warnings about potential criminals lurking around the dorms. But, you know, if there's neo-Nazis and Ku Klux Klan members in the dorms, you don't get warned. Um, you know, you, uh, the RS kind of ignore it for five weeks. Um, and then until they finally get moved to another dorm to, to, uh, to I'm assuming, harass other students. But again, I got your point. you know, I got so your point. yeah, I think... Uh, Again, there's a distinct lack of concern for African Americans, underrepresented minorities, and also, um, yeah, I think that priorities in housing and this university are all very screwed up, even though we like to claim diversity. Okay, I got your point. Um, Rick, and then Michael. So, so I wanted to address kind of the question at hand in terms of do we get the campus climate first? Or the RA and the answers. I, it, you know, I think that we have to obviously look at both of these things. I think the overall campus climate does just, uh, just like Dolores had pointed out, somehow filters down. But for me, I have so many questions in terms of the RAs and how things work. You know, I look at the things such as the CAPE monitoring system, it's the crisis has assessment and the intervention team, which only meets every other week or every two weeks. They're informed about this thing and they put it off for two more weeks. At what point is a crisis a crisis and do you respond to this? Is this underneath the, um, the structure of the RAs? Et so I have so many questions in order to, so, so I don't know if, which one do you put first, but I'm saying, but we have to dig into both of these because I do believe that it permeates the campus. I do believe it permeates the housing system. And I do believe it permeates the faculty. And I think that there's something here and we have to be able to okay. be able to look at it, but I don't know which one is first. Okay. But I know I have the most amount of questions on the yeah. RA's on the on the RA system because that what was is what was in the report. But I have not had a chance yet to review that, so I can't give you an intelligent answer. I got but you. I'm saying, but we've got to look at both. Okay, Michael. And I think one thing we need to do is look at the wisdom of having whole floors or whole dorms full of freshmen, because to be quite frank, up until recently there was diversity with respect to class level. And then a few years ago when we built CDC, we, we kind of passed the all freshmen have to live on campus law. And then that created a situation where upperclassmen didn't have as much access to on campus housing because we were filling it full of freshmen. And so just putting a bunch of freshmen together in that kind of volume has its own set of issues as well. So the classes are nice and, and some of these other ideas are fine. But that didn't happen the first three weeks of school. And it's going to take a couple of years to get to Area S. Mm -hmm. So there, if, you, if you're going to put a bunch of 18-year-olds, 17-year-olds in a, in, a, in a housing complex, we, we need to look at how we communicate acceptable behavior and non-acceptable behavior and, and what that means. Okay. okay, so we might look at the wisdom of that. All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to make an executive decision right now, and we're going to talk about campus climate next up. And that will inform... I think our questions more as we talk about the RA, so I, I think that's a very good suggestion. Okay. Uh, and that really depends if Dr. Murray can be available to come talk to us. So all we can do is reach out, and if she cannot be available um, for our next meeting, then we will we'll talk about the RAs. But my hope is I think we need to talk about climate, because a lot of these issues, they're all, we're all skirting it, now it's time to kind of leap in there and get it. And I think that will inform everything else that we're end up, that we're going to look at. Uh, so, um, so I will take steps immediately. I'm gonna send her email right now. Tomorrow. You guys okay, you that's fine. Yeah. Um, and the date of our next meeting. Do you all? Does anybody have the schedule? Yeah. February twenty. February twenty first. Thank you so much. February twenty first. Yeah, Thank February you. 21st. And that is a. Is that a? This it's is a Friday. Friday. It's a Friday. So let's see if she can come. And my notion is that we should just kick the meeting right off with it. We should just get her here, if she will, and ask her to uh, maybe talk to us 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, and hopefully you will have read the reports, so you know what she's talking about, and then we can ask questions. 
um, of her, not just about the report, but I mean, she's on faculty here, right? So she has a yes. sense about other things that, that are happening. And I would very much like to hear from her. I, yes. Uh, there's, uh, there are several people, I think key people, that were very involved in that report, other faculty and, and others that uh, I think could be suggested, particularly if Dr. Murray is not available. Okay, but we'll, we'll go with her first, and if she's available, then uh, that's who we'd like to have come on. Is that all right with everyone about maybe she talks for about 20 minutes and then we ask our questions and see where we go from there. Uh, and then uh, the RAs will be, we do need to have the, the whole system, an RA system, we need to talk about that and be more informed about it. So either, and let me throw this out, do you think we would take the first hour and deal with the climate and then the second hour deal with the RA and just try to knock those out? Honestly, I think campus climate is a very long that, discussion. Hold, hold on one second. Let me, let me call Chris Yetian. Uh, I, well, actually, I'm Go about ahead. to say what Gary just said right. better Go than ahead. I did, oh, yeah. better than I would. Uh, I, I think we need to make sure that we leave enough time for campus climate. I, I would like to not see us try to rush through that topic because I think it can be a pretty deep topic. Okay. I do agree that we have a lot of things to look at. I think we all need to uh, really be informed to a greater extent on the various policies and practices that go on with RAs. But I think that process will be much more smooth once we have a little bit more information about the okay. campus climate itself, because I think that will help to inform right. our questions. Uh, if I can, if I may, one thing that I want to also put on the agenda for future meetings is also to talk about uh, the administrative response to all of these various things. So if we look at the campus climate, that's one thing. If we look at policies and procedures for RAs and and in that uh, kind of area of the campus, that's another thing. But I think it's also important to see, given all of these, uh, you know, given the dynamics of campus climate and all the policies and procedures as they're written and how they work, in what ways do we see administration respond? Uh, how is it that uh, the larger administration helps to communicate to the campus community at large with faculty and staff about some of these issues? Um, because I think that that's the way to try to help us put together the larger picture of how the campus actually works with okay. all the components uh, okay. put together. All right, I have that down. Um, I'd like to make it a recommendation that in addition to inviting Susan Murray, which is, you know, she has a great report, but to also invite the chair of campus climate, Wigsy Sieverton, who has a much broader picture and a history of the campus climate um, over the years. Okay, L let me think about it because I, I really want this report to be kind of front and center, and I want to give the professor enough time to talk about it and us to ask her about it. Um, where's Weetzi? I see you over there. Uh, so let, let me just, I'm going to hold off on that, and don't, I'm not going to put, I'm just going to keep Dr. Murray right now for our next meeting with this report, um, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I'm, I'm not putting it aside. I, I absolutely value her input, Weetzi's input. Um, Yes, yes. Um, you talk about a public hearing roughly. When do you see that That's happening? why I'm going to go next. Okay, Thank you. Ahead. Read my mind. So the next issue I want to bring up is input from members of the public, from the San Jose State community and beyond. Uh, at, I want to do that early on because any recommendations we make have to be informed by what people tell us and what they are thinking as well. When do you, do you think should that should be meeting number three or should we have the RA? Because I want to devote an entire, it, I, I don't know, my sense is maybe we wouldn't use the whole two hours, but I want to give the two hours to members of the public, once they've heard all of this, to come up and talk to us. Uh, and my notion is, depending on the number of people, um, there could, you could have three minutes, you could have five minutes, or it could be two. If I have you know, 300 people here, we're not going to be here you know, into the early morning hours, so that will determine that by how many show up. Um, so when do you all... What's your, what's your thinking about if we have Dr. Murray, Professor Murray, Dr. Murray, uh, the next meeting, talk about campus climate. We still want to talk about the RA system, and I want public input. What's your thinking? Question. Go, ahead. Go right ahead. Well, I, I first of all think you're going to have um, quite a few people who want to talk about campus climate. And it might be that you have the, the next meeting an hour on the report presentation, and then an hour on public hearing related to campus climate. And then your next meeting, you have, you know, you have provide additional time. Because I think, you know, providing just one day, a lot of people may not be able to make that. Mm -hmm. So I think giving two opportunities or more for a public hearing. But, you know, so like one half on mm -hmm. the report and one half on the hearing might give us, you know, a broader sense of it. So what do you all think? So if we had Dr. Murray and we had questions for her for an hour, and then we move the second hour, we shut up, basically, mm -hmm. and we let the public talk to us. Do you all want to do it that way? At least initially. That isn't the only public input we're going to have. 
Um, right. I think in regards to public so, input. So hold on a second, Gary. I, I, I want to address, actually, I think that's a really good idea. The first thing, I did not want to combine the two. I think that we, I don't want to play short shrift to something. I know that personally, I probably will have a lot of questions. I haven't even reviewed the campus climate report. However, I already have questions about the campus climate. I would like to find a way to balance out the ability of the public to also talk after the campus climate report is done, and maybe that will also help to inform some of our questions. I, I don't know how many members of the public would, uh, would like to talk. Obviously, I'd look to the chair to limit the discussion so that we could hear what the public has to say, and that might, uh, like I said, inform some of the additional questions. So if there's a way that we could combine both, um, being as we go forward, whatever the discussion is, whatever the presentation is, that we allow the public to also testify because they might bring information that others didn't know, saying, well, I have an instance I could give you. Okay. I have a certain, so, so uh, sure. I would support combining it. Sure, so, I, I, so what you're saying, even going forward as we have other meetings, if we have a major topic, maybe devote an hour, our questions, and then saying to the public, we want to hear from you. Again, but here's the thing I don't want. I do not want us then questioning people from the public. I want people to speak and speak freely, say what's on their minds, hopefully in a respectful fashion, right? And then we take all that information in, and then we may have a meeting where we have, there's no public input, and we discuss all the stuff that we're, we're getting, all right? So, but maybe we should do this just going forward one meeting at a time. Go ahead, yeah, Marcos. Maybe, maybe we can just also ask for them to provide their contact information so that if somebody presents something and we do want to follow up with questions, we could do that? Sure. So one thing we could do, and when the public speaks, uh, I'm, I, you know, I was on the Palo Alto City Council and people wanted to speak, you, you fill out a card and you yep. just had your name on it and if you, some way where we could contact. So if we wanted to follow up, we could do yes. it. So we could do that yep. and then uh, you know, have a place for the person to speak. And, and generally it's, it's about, if you can't say what you need to say in three minutes, then you need to think about it again because you should be able to say it in three yes. minutes, which is pretty. Uh, and, and that's my thinking, probably three minutes. Uh, yep. But if we're packed, I mean, I, I probably will still keep it at three because I hated it when I got limited to two minutes and like, what, you know. So um, that's my thinking on this. So um, for next meeting, so the 21st, we're thinking of if Dr. Murray's available, we have her for the first hour. And it's just she's talking to us and we're talking to her. And then we're going to open it up to the public and we're going to hear from the public for an hour. Okay on that issue of, of the uh, campus climate. That's the topic for our next meeting, right? And then we will decide at the end of that meeting where we go next. My thinking is we really need to get that RA information in yes, and have sure. people in and maybe have the second half open to the public again, talking about maybe their experiences, either as RAs or interacting with RAs or even getting suggestions, again, from people about what they think ought to happen. This is how we're gonna make our recommendations from getting the input from all of you and from the public. Nice. Okay, so we I'm, now have, yes, Delora. I'm hoping it's not just the RAs. I, I want the yeah. full chain I, you, of command you know what I'm, uh, within the RA okay, system. Let me clarify, yeah. when I say RA, I mean the entire system. Thank That's you. That's what, what, every time I say life? Say it again? Can we just change it to res Thank life? Thank you, yeah. that's the word I need. So exactly. our, that will be a meeting, will be on residential life and then we'll figure out who the people should come to present. Yeah, Thank you for that. Yeah, because we about to have an hour of it was not my fault at the net first yep. public hearing. Got it. Okay, Gary. Um, I, think in I think in regards to um, public commentary and campus climate, I think it would behoove us to especially try to get students who are on the receiving end of the negative campus climate, particularly African American and Latino students. Um, yeah, as well as faculty. Um, I, I don't think we necessarily need a thousand random San Jose citizens making public commentary about some of their state. Well, Gary, you know, we can't limit. Yeah, I mean, whoever right. wants to come, if it's important to them, they'll be here uh, and or send somebody and, and they'll have more than one opportunity to talk. But we certainly are in no position to limit and say someone can't talk. Whatever your experience is, you can come forward. And I want to stress, th this, is, this is a respectful environment we've created. Whatever your views are, Whatever your views, nobody's uh -oh. going to get booed, nobody's going to get cheered. We just need information so yeah. that we can, can make this a better place. Chris. Yeah. And I appreciate what you're saying about that, but also I, I, one of the things that I've seen happen on this campus before in other types of forum is uh, where you have people from the community who speak and then students kind of get shut out. And so while I know we're, the goal is to not limit people, I just want to make sure that we make an effort to make sure that San Jose State students can be heard and students can will be all right so one thing i could do 
We could start the meeting, you know, the second half, and I could say, all right, we're going to take students first. That would yes. be great. Right? Do, do staff yeah, people get to come to this thing? Staff. Yes. Can, yeah. can we, can we, we, we seem to have I, a I'm minimum just saying, that, I'm just that, saying. That, that there's nobody up here but students? Sure. I'm just okay. making a just suggestion. One way is to say students so, can speak and staff, or we just leave it alone and let people speak as they come in. Yes. Madam Chair, I think the, the key is, and you're trying to, I think, put it in the right perspective for us to give us our marching orders. And it's about the campus community, you know, and at the center of the campus community is all that we've heard. And alumni are part of that campus community. Right. And the surrounding community that are impacted are part of that campus community. I know that the focus ultimately is going to be, recommendations are going to center on the campus climate. <coughs> okay, how welcoming is our campus? Okay, if it's not welcoming, what is it that we need to do to roll out that welcome mat? We have to honor and, and recognize our shortcomings, and we've done a little bit of that tonight. But we also then have to hear from others to be able to say, okay, there are some things we hadn't really thought about, mm -hmm. be it from residence life and housing, be it from all the peer mentors and peer advisors out there. We talked a little bit about personal responsibility. We talked about freshmen in the report that came to campus in August and brought their baggage from home with them. Okay, we can't not recognize some of those things as we move forward. So I appreciate you shaping that conversation because there's a lot there, folks, and you all know there's a lot there. Mm -hmm. And we have to be mindful of the time frame in which we have to get our work done. Every one of our meetings is limited to about two hours. And again, with all that has to be said, we then, at some point in time, we're really going to have to focus and really come with a, pro uh, a finished product when it's all said and done. So right. I appreciate the direction which you're taking us, knowing full well that when you have uh, a room and you invite people to speak, we will have to limit the conversation so that we can get our work done. Absolutely. And thank you. I appreciate the remarks. Uh, is there anything else we want to talk about right now at this meeting? I want to say thank you. You're welcome, Michael. You're welcome. Um, we're moving. Um, and Thank you. Gabrielle. Uh, this might be best for next meeting, but I just wanted, you had mentioned this earlier, um, but just to note the importance of the communication when there's a concern from the student to either administration of housing or um, wherever, because on the fact-finding report on page 25, it was um, stated that on SJSU confessions, I haven't been on this website, but I've heard so much about it. It's anonymous based, and whenever there's a concern or just students, um, anyone venting, they put something on there, and that's actually how um, the one of the oh, RAs yes. right. found out about the flag incident. So I think if we did implement, you know, just having a link that was very um, accessible, not just on the president's page, um, would be very productive. Excellent. All right. Well, um, I'm going to I have a question. Yes, go ahead. I was, uh, were you talking about a, a, a link um, for yes. the students in general? So yes, um, so it could be okay. residents or students that even don't reside on campus, because a lot of the times, for example, even if you reach out to an RA, it's you identify yourself. Oh, I live in this room or this suite, and sometimes people are too shy for that. Okay and to kind of um, help aid you know, those individuals that are too shy, they still have an outlet and there could be a response um, to whatever inquiry they have. Okay, that, uh, that's good. And the reason I asked also, I thought you were saying, and which I think might be a good idea, is that this committee ha have a link. That, um, because we're not gonna get everybody in through a public hearing, no matter how many we have. And um, do we wanna set up a link where people who can't make an evening hearing um, would have the opportunity to send in their comments, not books, uh, but you know, like you know, some yeah, reasonable, uh, you know, some like a three-minute version. From Twitter or mouth? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little more than Twitter, but yeah. but I'm wondering if it's so, if so. Who's we, who's going to read all these? I mean, if we get flooded, I mean, somebody's got to say, okay, I'm going to read all these, and, and I'm really concerned. I know my time is such. That I, I'm, no, I, I don't disagree. Be a, I, I think that problem. that will be a problem, but uh, I got about 400 pages worth of stuff, and I've got another hundred coming. Um, right. And I'm committed to, to go to that. And it might be that we take this, uh, whatever we get, 
and we say, okay, we divide up in, in groups, you know, you two read 100, you two read it. And I'm not sure we have to get through it all. I'm just thinking of, um, of a way of giving, because you mentioned alumni. Alumni may not come here, but might have a good perspective on the climate. So I'm just trying to think of ways to uh, give us to get their the greatest amount of input, yeah. recognizing that we may not go the all, but again, if you limit it, Got we it. should be able to get it all done. All right. Let me, let me think about that one and see maybe I can come back with some suggestions and then you all might have some as well. Coach? Or just, uh, you know, make our information public in terms of they can just email us directly, I I any person on the committee. I'm gonna and we can bring address. it forward. And that way <laughs> one person won't get, you know, flooded with, with tons not, of... Uh, no, I, I can't. Don't know. I don't know. It's your address we're going to give um, <laughs> Can I get back on, on one topic? I said that at another meeting we're going to talk about the residential life system. We also want to talk about housing as well, right? About, you know, placement. So we might want to, is that, is that all part of it? About the placement of students? Is that all part of residential life? Okay, so that, that's going to be a meeting, okay? That's something we're really, really going to need to talk about. All right, I, I believe um, we are done with our business today. I uh, thank, uh, greatly appreciate those of you who came to observe the proceedings. And next meeting, we're going to hear from you all. Um, these, my understanding is that these meetings are being audio taped as well, and they will be transcribed, and transcriptions will be available within 48 hours. Is that not happening? It's not happening. All right. I thought we were going that way. It is being streamed. It is being live streamed. Thank you all so much. This meeting's adjourned. All right, thank you. See you next week.